Welcome to the 2023 annual Winter Star Party, and it's not virtual this year. Yeah! Uh, last time we were here was 2020, and we got home, and within three weeks of being home, the nation was locked down, and we haven't been back since. This is our first time back in a while, and as I imagine, many of you are as well. Okay, today I'm going to talk primarily about the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll be talking a little bit about the Hubble too because as you can see almost everything you see on the web now is comparisons to James Webb and Hubble. And I kind of feel like NASA in their attempt to promote the Webb Telescope are kind of stepping on Hubble a little bit. Uh, Hubble is a fantastic piece of equipment. It's been up there long, long past its prime. Uh, I think it's been up there like 30 years now, taking awesome pictures. And to show, show an image of the Hubble next to the James Webb isn't quite comparing apples to apples. So I, I think they're doing a little bit of disservice there. And I'm going to talk about why I believe that's so. Uh, First thing is we sent the Hubble up, and 30 years ago it was the best technology we had, even though we sent it up there flawed. But fortunately we were able to get astronauts up there and fix the problems, and Hubble did a wonderful job. Hubble also realized, we realized after we sent Hubble up, there's things Hubble can't do. And so 30 years ago, the people at NASA and the ESA and all around the world started working on what originally was not called the James Webb Space Telescope, but the Next Generation Telescope. Uh, so basically we looked at all the things that the Hubble could do and couldn't do and said, well, let's build a telescope that can do what Hubble can't. And that's why the pictures look so much different because we're doing something totally different with the James Webb. We're not doing the same thing we did with the Hubble, and that's why those comparisons look that way. So to begin, let's, let's go back and do a little bit of basics, okay? Our, our eye is kind of like a telescope. It collects light. Light comes from a star, hits our eye, follows organic wires to our brain, which is like a computer, and it forms an image, and we see. Uh, Telescopes do the same thing. They collect light, they send it through wires to a CPU, and it makes pictures, it sees. So our eyes on our telescopes are basically kind of the same thing. Only problem is our eye only gets about seven, diameter, seven millimeters in diameter at its best, like maybe a quarter inch, where telescopes can be made much, much bigger and much, much brighter. The millimeter, our eyes are seven millimeters in diameter. A cat, their pupil will open up to cover almost the entire image of their eyes. That's why you see sometimes cats, instead of having the little slits, their pupils just extend all the way out. So they've got an eye four times bigger than ours, basically. They can see things four times brighter. And that's why when a cat goes out at night, he's perfectly fine, where we're tripping over stuff and walking into stuff. And, the main difference between our eyes and a telescope is that they are so much bigger. The Hubble is almost eight feet in diameter. That's a lot bigger than our eyes. It's going to gather a lot more light. The James Webb is 21 feet in diameter. So it's going to gather a whole lot more light than the Hubble. That's one reason the pictures look better. It's a bigger light gathering instrument. The focal length of the Hubble is 189 feet. If you ever seen, if you ever been to the Smithsonian and seen this thing on display, it, it's bigger than a bus. I mean, it's huge. Uh, the focal length of the James Webb is 431 feet. Could you even imagine that? Having your objective here and your secondary out by the water out there. I mean, <laughs> how? How would we even point that thing? And the Hubble collects 49 square feet of light. 
whereas the web is collecting 273 square feet of light. Lot, so, I mean, just right there, the comparison, there is no comparison. It, it's in a whole different class. And the most important attribute of the James Webb Space Telescope has something special going on. It can see in the infrared. Okay, so here's the visible spectrum. Here's ultraviolet, over here's the infrared end of the spectrum. And we can't see nothing over here. We can't see nothing over here. Uh, one thing that everybody didn't think about when we sent the Hubble up, Hubble can see over here. Hubble can see very well into the infrared. Or, I'm sorry. Thank you. The ultraviolet. Correct me when I do stupid stuff like that, okay? Uh, but yeah, so now there's a lot of scientists out there right now saying, hey, let's use the Hubble and let's go examine in the ultraviolet range where we can see the birth of new stars because they emit a lot of high ultraviolet light. So some people are talking maybe we should retire Hubble. Others are saying, hey, wait a minute, it's still useful. Let's keep it going. Uh, our good pal from SpaceX has actually submitted a proposal to NASA to send up a rocket and attach it to the Hubble. Uh, as you guys know, the Hubble's only, what, 150 miles up? And we're coming into solar minim maximum, and they're saying with the increased ionization that's going to be happening in the near future, that's going to drag the Hubble low, and it could crash to the ground. So Musk said, hey, let me send a little rocket up there. We'll attach it, and when the thing starts getting low, we'll just boost it back up. It could last forever up there. So don't rule out the, hu the Hubble yet, guys. Oh, and there's going to be a test at the end of this talk. So. No, there isn't. Say we want to look at something that in the laboratory is at 600 nanometers in a lab. A nearby star, because it's moving away from us, is going to be redshifted, right? We all learned about that in high school, I think. Uh, a nearby galaxy is going to be shifted way over there. A far away galaxy is going to be there. And if you go to the top row, what's that say? The very, very distant galaxies, they're red shifted so much we can't even see them anymore. And that's one of the things that we never realized until we sent Hubble up. And Hubble's like, where'd the galaxy go? We can't, you know, it, it, we can't see past a certain point. And I'll show you what that point is here in a little bit, but uh, that's one of the main reasons for the James Webb Telescope is so we can go further back in time to those very, very, very distant galaxies that were created after the Big Bang and see them even though they're redshifted beyond the control of a normal optical telescope. So, so here, here's what I was trying to show. Here's this, this slide. Um, this end of the slide represents our time now. And here's the Big Bang. Can you all see that? Okay, so the Hubble, the Goods, the Chandra, the Deep Field Telescope are all optical instruments that only can see light back to here. Once you get past there, it's red shifted beyond the ability of a white light scope to see. And that's when the first galaxies were getting created right around that time. So the scientists realized in order to see back here where the first stars began, we need to go further and further into the infrared in order to see that. The Webb's telescope mirrors, and I was surprised to learn this. I was very surprised to learn that the Webb's telescope, there's how many of them? 18? Well, however many there are, I forget. Uh, but they're not made of glass. Uh, glass is just too heavy for what they wanted to build. Uh, you got to realize when we sent the Hubble up, we set it up into low Earth orbit, and it was only 150 miles up, and we could send a shuttle up there and work on it. This thing, since it's detecting in the infrared, it can't be near a planet 
can't be near the sun, can't be near any celestial bodies because they are absorbing sunlight and reflecting out into space. So it's just too bright in low Earth orbit. So we actually had to send the James Webb telescope all folded up in its little box all the way out, I forget how many millions of miles it was away, to the L2 point where it could go out there and just sit there and not have gravitational forces pulling on it and then deploy it. So once we got it there, we had to open up those mirrors. We had to open up the big heat sail. Had to open everything up and it had to work because there's no way we can get an astronaut out there to that point in space to fix anything that goes wrong. So they really, really, really built a lot of redundancy into this thing. The mirror is not made of glass. It's made of a substance called beryllium. Any, we got any mechanical engineers here know exactly what that is? I, best I can tell, it's kind of like those little, you, do you know what beryllium is? It's an element. Is it a metal? It's a metal. And the other thing that I was really surprised to learn, uh, well, the first part of this I knew. I know that a mirror reflects 85 to 95 percent of the light that strikes it. And that depends on what kind of silvering you use, whether you use aluminum or some other exotic stuff that the telescopes have in them today. But gold reflects 99% of the light that hits it. So they used gold on this beryllium mirror because it will reflect that much more light. The other thing is that gold reflects very, very well into the infrared rays. And I did not know that either. That was, so I, I was really astounded to learn that. Uh, so as I said, this was originally uh, penned to be the next generation telescope, but somewhere along the way, uh, the people at NASA decided to name it after James Webb. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard some of the controversy going on over James Webb. James Webb was like the first NASA administrator, and he held that post for quite a number of years. But after they changed the name, a lot of people started coming forward and say, well, he didn't, he wasn't really all inclusive. He didn't hire, he only hired white people, put it that way. And that's what started coming out, and people started saying this stuff. And so NASA ended up setting up a board and looking at his hiring practices, and they decided, well, there really wasn't any evidence of him doing that. So be what it may, they kept that name, uh, for better or worse. Uh, I don't know. Time will tell, I guess. The web was launched Christmas Day, 2021. Uh, we should have been planning for a winter star party then, but it was virtual that year, so it cost 10 billion U.S. dollars to build. Was, yeah, that's all, just 10 billion. Whether we'll get a return on that is, the future will tell, I guess. We don't know yet. Okay, and as I said, it, the sensitivity of the James Webb <clears throat> is far beyond what the Hubble did. So again, we're not going to compare the two. There we go, 18 separate segments in, in that mirror. And each one, as you notice, is not quite much smaller than the Hubble. And they were all folded up in the scope until they got it to the L2 point, and then they started opening it up. Probably one of the most advanced features on it is the tennis court sized five layer sun shield. So again, even out there millions of miles away from the Earth at the L2 point, you still got a lot of solar wind and radiation coming that way. So they needed to block that from that sensitive mirror in order to get it to work. So one of the main mission goals was to search for the first galaxies and or luminous objects, stars, that formed after the Big Bang. 
and then to determine how the galaxies evolved because you know we've got galaxies like right now up in the sky m m31 m we can see what that galaxy looks like today we can find a similar galaxy and go back with the hubble and see what it looked like several million years billion years ago maybe uh, we can go back with the James Webb and see what it looked like as it formed. And from that, we can extrapolate, here's how that galaxy evolved and changed over time. I think that part is probably the most incredible thing to be able to do. That's like showing, what's your name, sir? Doug. 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 That's like showing Doug's baby picture, his teenage picture, and his picture now. You're, you're going to see that change. And we're going to be able to see that in galaxies now. I, I think that's pretty incredible. Thank you, Doug. I think I already went over this stuff. But one thing I did think was really important on this slide. So we've got these 18 mirrors that are like huge. I, I forget how much I said the square feet of them was. It was around 40 square feet, something like that. But anyways, uh, the thickness of gold coating on the beryllium surfaces of 100 times 10, okay, it's 1,000 angstroms, okay? And the surface area there is 25 square meters. So using these numbers plus the density of gold at room temperature, the coating is calculated to use 48 grams of gold. Now, I thought this thing as big as it was. It must have taken a lot of gold, 48 grams. I mean, that's about the size of a golf ball. That's how much gold they used to cover all those 18 mirrors. I don't know, I just like the little minutia of things sometimes. Uh, little things like that I really enjoy learning about and sharing with people. Okay, there's four pieces of primary gear here. Uh, the near infrared camera, that's the NIR cam. And that, that's the primary imager that's gonna cover the infrared wavelength range from 0.6 to 5 microns. It'll, it's capable of detecting light from the earliest stars and galaxies in the process of formation. The population of stars in nearby galaxies as well as young stars in the Milky Way and Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, it's also equipped with a coronagraph so they can use that to look at uh, planets around stars. They're able to dim that starlight down and see the actually see the planets. Just like when the sun's all bright and you hold your hand up and you kind of look through your fingers and it blocks out most of the sun, but you can still see a little bit if you look between your fingers. The slit in the spectrograph does the same thing. It blocks all that bright light out so you can see the faint objects nearby. Uh, then there's the near-infrared spectrograph and that goes from 0.6 to 5.3 microns for spectroscopy at resolving powers of about 100, 1,000, and 2,700 microns in four different observing modes. The web also has a cryo cooler for cooling the mid-infrared detectors of other instruments. Uh, they're actually, this camera needs to be at seven degrees Kelvin to work. You, you guys all familiar with the Kelvin system? It, Zero degrees Kelvin is like, uh, there's, no, <laughs> there's nothing there to measure. It's, so that's getting pretty cold. And they had to have that cryogenic cooler because even though they got that shield uh, blocking radiation coming from the sun and the planets and any other objects that are up there, these instruments as they're working also create heat. And they have to be protected from that in order to work properly. So this, this thing's a real, real innovation. Uh, Miri has both a camera and a spectrograph that sees light in the mid-infrared range. And it goes all, it covers the wavelengths from 5 to 28 microns in the part of the spectrum that our eyes can't see. Oh, and their, their little blurb says, this spectrograph will enable medium resolution spectroscopy, providing new physical details of the distant objects it will observe. Uh, then we got a whole little fleet of instruments here that they're using to actually guide 
the telescope and track. Well, I guess they don't need to track. They're not on the Earth, so the thing is stationary. Somehow this thing allows them to point at an object and maintain on it. And it's got several instruments to do that. There's some gyroscopes in there. and I, I forget whether there were thrusters or anything. But. So the major innovations of the web, lightweight optics, uh, much, much lighter than glass, uh, the deployable sun shield, the folding segmented mirrors, the detectors. I mean, when we sent Hubble up there, that was 30 years ago. Uh, light detection uh, cameras and, and the such have improved a whole lot in the last 30 years. So this, this is all brand new stuff up there, cutting edge. Uh, the cryogenic actuators and the mirror control and the micro shutters. Uh, hopefully, I'm hoping some of that, uh, the micro shutters, hopefully that'll work its way down to us. <laughs> and we, we can have, start using those shutters in the future. In, the, in a conventional telescope, we see a lot of the nebulosity and the dust and the stuff that's up there, the hydrogen and the helium and all the stuff that's floating around up in space. We see all that. The web, because it's looking through infrared, doesn't really see that as well as it sees the stuff behind it that's glowing. It's looking for the glowing stuff. So it's kind of a treat to be able to, anybody know what that is? Is that part of the Eagle Nebula? Okay. So it can look at the eagle and say, okay, I don't want to see all that dust. Boom, it's gone. They can see what's behind it. So again, the ability to look at something in a different way than we've ever seen it before, I think is pretty incredible. And that's, that's one of the big pluses of the web. And again, same thing there. Here you see pretty much dust. And you can see one of the very brighter stars poking through the dust over there you see right through the dust and see the glowing portions behind them. Same thing there. So again, I, I gotta point out that, you know, the Hubble wasn't a piece of crap that we just sent up there because that's what we do. I mean, it was cutting edge in its day and if used appropriately in the future, it can still be cutting edge. So let's not, let's not look at these pictures and say, well, let's just let Hubble crash into the ocean because it can still do a lot of science. Oh, okay, there, there's my little information piece I was looking for. Uh, the L2 point is 5 million kilometers away from the sun, the moon, and the earth. So to send something 5 million miles away and then hope that you start pushing these buttons and everything starts unfolding, and that was a real leap of faith for NASA and all the people involved, and I'm just incredibly surprised that everything worked. And the thing is up there running and taking pictures like it does. And again, the reason they sent it there is because you need to be at the very most 50 degrees above zero Kelvin. Uh, most of the stuff works best at between three and seven degrees, but some of it will work up to 50 degrees, and that's where you need to be, and you just can't get that here in close Earth orbit. So, the next time you see a Hubble web comparison, I know you guys don't do this because you're amateur astronomers and you know what it's all about, but please don't say, oh, look at that piece of crap. We had to throw, drop that thing in the ocean, you know. It, uh, the Hubble did a lot of good work. It's still doing a lot of good work. They're primarily using it right now to spot exoplanets. Uh, that's one of the things it's really good at and someone's just proposed that they start using the ultraviolet end of the Hubble to start looking at new star formation, uh, places like the Orion Nebula and the Eagle. And, and we got to thank Hubble because without sending Hubble up there, we didn't know what the next step should be. We didn't know what to do next. It's like, this is the biggest, most powerful telescope we've ever sent into space. What do we do next? Well, nobody knew then, but now, through observing Hubble, we've learned that these were the steps to be taken. And NASA's already working on the next 
next generation telescope that they're actually saying it's still on the drawing boards, but construction will probably begin around 2030, and it could be in space as early as 2050. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's what we're hoping for, 2050. Uh, I was hoping for that, but I don't, I don't see it happening. So that's, that's it. That's all I have for today. Hey John, uh, uh, yes, sir. What, what's, the, what's the limiting factor on the uh, lifetime of this instrument? Is it the rate solar radiation or the mechanics of it? I would say right now nobody probably really knows. Uh, I have learned that since it's been in orbit, which has only been like maybe a year, yeah, maybe a year and a couple months. They've already had 17 uh, micro meteors strike the mirrors in different spots. Uh, one of the really cool things, uh, for all you astro imagers in here that process images, you know that you can, uh, if you've got an airplane going through, you can tell it, skip that erase that airplane going through there. Well, NASA's doing the same thing. Whenever they get a micrometeorite hit and there's a hole in the mirror, they just tell their editing program, don't look at that area, but look at the surrounding area and take the brightness in those images and extrapolate to the center what should be there. And it's working great. They're, they're looking at this and they're not seeing any holes in the mirrors. So. Uh, now, of course, if a big one ever hit, that would end it right there. I mean, that, it would be done. Uh, at that extreme cold, uh, so far the electronics haven't seemed to care that it's that cold. Uh, of course, like, heat is the enemy of electronics, so maybe cold is its friend? <laughs> Who knows? But. I mean, there's anything, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Same with Hubble. Someone said, you know, Hubble's 30 years old. It's like your car. Uh, if something breaks on your car, well, it, it could be done. It, so same thing with Hubble. If something major breaks, that's it. It's finished. But barring anything breaking, it could run for another 30 years. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, you mentioned the cryocooling. Is that a finite resource that it has? I believe it's electronic, uh, probably like some kind of peltier device or, uh, although I can't imagine any peltier device here on Earth. Well, I guess the cryogenics labs have some pretty neat stuff that can get down to, so they're probably using something like that. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. Well, I don't think they've released too much of that yet. Uh, it's still pretty er Yeah. Yeah. Well, not because of any cover-ups or anything like that. It's just you, you got to realize they have, the thing is constantly running. 24-7, it's taking pictures. Then we have to get them on Earth and process them. And as any of you astro imagers know, we go out and we spend four hours taking an image and then we spend the next 12 hours processing it. So there's a backlog, so they haven't really gotten into the newest stuff yet. And that's why you'll see every week, if you go on the Web, James Webb Space Telescope site, every week they're releasing new information and new pictures as they're getting it processed. So yeah, it's, it's just a matter of logistics is all it is. So I'm sure it'll be coming soon. Yes, sir? Has the web uh, discovered any exoplanets yet? I believe so, yes. Uh, I, matter of fact, I think it's already in the area of hundreds of them. Trivia question. Yeah. Oh, boy, here we go. Okay. How 
How much in earthly dollars is 40 grams of gold? All right, guys, who's, who's the gold aficionados here? Yeah, 40 grams of gold. How much is that worth in earthly dollars? That's all? No. Wow. Hmm? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Just multiply by 300. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm guessing the beryllium probably cost more than the gold did. So, especially that much of it and that big and casting all those to those specifications. And, uh, yeah. They were expecting the beer. Shots to hit. Mm -hmm. that Not so, yes. Yes, you would think out there at that Lagrange point there'd be nothing moving around. It, that's an area where the gravity is equal in all directions, so everything should be pretty much stationary at that point. So to get that many hits in about a year, that's like they're getting hit every month. So statistically, uh, there, there's a chance we get a big one. If you're getting 13 small ones in a year, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, is that it? Any more questions? All right, thank you all for coming.